Mr. Secretary, Jim, uh, that's one of my favorite quotes in the world. It has always inspired me, and tonight I wipe the dust and sweat and blood off just to be presentable. But uh, thanks so much, uh, and I have a couple more words to say, but let me just uh, express my pleasure and pride in being able to be here uh, tonight with all of you. It's a great honor for me, and I am particularly uh, gratified uh, to be here with my friend Jim Baker, who uh, we work together a number of things and touch on it in one moment. But President LeBron, LeBron thank you very, very much for your leadership here. Uh, friends and guests, and Shell, I, I know uh, somewhere in the audience are Shell, oh, there they are. Thank you very, very much, Marvin, and uh, thank you for sponsoring this uh, lecture. And I want to thank uh, the university and Ed Dujerian, who is in Armenia, and Ben Stevenson of the Baker Center for inviting me uh, to be here. And I want to thank uh, the students who are here. I, I don't know how many of you are so looking for an excuse to put off studying for finals, uh, but I'm very glad to see you, none the same. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, two very, very special guests. Uh, Deborah and Mark uh, Tice are here. They live locally, and their son Austin was taken captive in Syria over three and a half years ago. Uh, Austin was doing work that we all know is absolutely vital. After serving in the Marine Corps in Afghanistan, he was a journalist, freelance journalist, trying to shed light on the war in Syria, partly because the experiences he had learned in war. And he wanted other people to know about it uh, and how, how that terrible conflict affects the most vulnerable people. So, Deborah and Mark, I know that I speak for everyone here in saying that our hearts and our prayers are with you. We are inspired by your courage and by your love for your son, and I will personally continue to do everything possible that I can to see that Austin returns home safely and soon. To all of you, um, this is not my first time in Houston and not the first time here at Rice, but I am really delighted uh, to be here in Houston. And earlier this afternoon, um, I had the honor of saying hello and talking over world issues with our country's 41st president and one of our greatest living Americans, George H.W. Bush. And as we all know, uh, as we all know, the former president is known for being a very kind man. And today he certainly proved it by not reminding me that when I was the Democratic nominee, I got trashed here in Texas. Uh, the silver lining is that uh, if the election had ended differently, folks, I never would have become Secretary of State and I wouldn't be here tonight with Secretary Baker and all of you. Uh, that, my friends, is a privilege. Rice University uh, bills itself as a community of curious thinkers, passionate dreamers, and energetic doers. Nobody here has any doubt that Jim Baker qualifies on every single one of those counts. Uh, it may be the Houston in his blood, uh, but I got to tell you folks, I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. Uh, at the same time, let me tell you unequivocally, and I have told this to him before, there is no one that I would rather have on my side in a fight. As Secretary of State, he helped to end the Cold War. He helped, uh, he, he really set the model, frankly, for how to do it, and I have followed some of his model with respect to our efforts against Daesh. In assembling a coalition to roll back the invasion of Kuwait, he broke that ground, uh, helped to reunify Germany, and laid the groundwork for NATO enlargement. And that is an extraordinary resume. But I have to tell you that Secretary Baker did pose a challenge at times for our interpreters. It's hard enough to transform English into Arabic. It is even harder when the speaker is Texan. 
I want you just to imagine being the translator when Secretary Baker told Syria's President Assad to his face, if a bullfrog had wings, it wouldn't scrape its butt on the ground. <laughs> Try that one. Uh, talk about speaking truth to power. <laughs> But uh, he got his point across, and he got his coalition done. Uh, one of Rice's great distinctions is that it does pride itself on unconventional thinking. And so tonight, I want to walk with you through some unconventional territory by talking about the vital but not always well understood ways in which religion has an impact on U.S. foreign policy. Now, my basic argument is pretty straightforward. The more we understand religion, and the better able we are as a result to be able to engage religious actors, the more effective our diplomacy will be in advancing the interests and values of our people. Now, disclaimer, it is absolutely true the State Department is a secular institution, and that from its founding, the United States has maintained a formal separation, obviously, between church and state, and nothing that we're doing seeks to or does cross any of those lines. This means that in our foreign policy, we don't advocate on behalf of any particular set of religious beliefs or express a preference for one faith over another, or even for religious belief over non-belief. But this doesn't mean that religion is irrelevant to our approach to world affairs, and particularly in this globalized, different world we are living in today. As a child of a Foreign Service officer, a Navy veteran, a senator for almost 30 years, and now as Secretary of State, I have seen firsthand the pervasive impact that religious belief and actions motivated by religious identity have on world events. It's why I've often said that if I had a chance to go back to college all over again, one of the subjects I would absolutely like to study is comparative religion. Consider that four out of five people on earth align themselves with one religious tradition or another. And that over the centuries, religious teachings, movements, and conflicts have done as much as any secular ideology or economic force to determine the political context and geographical boundaries that define the international arena. Religion today remains deeply consequential, affecting the values, the actions, the choices, the worldview of people in every walk of life on every continent and obviously also here at home. It is a part of what drives some to initiate war others to pursue peace, some to organize for change, others to cling desperately to old ways, resist modernity, some to reach eagerly across the borders of nation and creed, and others to build higher and higher walls separating one group from the next. But religion is not only pervasive, it is also complex especially when viewed from the ground up. Most religions are internally diverse, reflecting multiple schools of thought, regional variations, and complicated histories. And the actions of religious communities, like all communities, are embedded in the political, economic, and cultural environment in which they are carried out. That is why religion, as it is actually lived, does not always look the way that we expect or have the impact that we anticipate. It is also why our engagement with religious actors has to extend beyond designated leaders to the rank and file. Now, historically, the State Department has tended to downplay the role of religion or pay attention only when religion is deemed a problem a threat, a challenge. The department has not traditionally had the resources or made the necessary commitment to systematically analyze the importance that religion holds 
for the success or failure of our foreign policy. One of my predecessors, Madeleine Albright, point out that when she entered the office as Secretary of State, she had advisors on political, military, economic, developmental issues, but none on the key topic of religion. Now that has changed. And the purpose of my remarks tonight is to explain what we now do differently and why those differences matter. First of all, since becoming Secretary, I have made a regular and intentional effort to benefit from the wisdom and to exchange ideas with representatives of the major religious traditions. To that end, I have met with Pope Francis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Sunni and Shia Muslim leaders, representatives of Jewish communities in Europe and the United States, American Hindus, Orthodox Christians, and many more. But for obvious reasons of time, the personal efforts of any Secretary of State can never be nearly enough. And that is why in 2013, when I became Secretary, in my first year, first months, I established an Office of Religion and Global Affairs headed by Sean Casey, who is here with us tonight, one of our country's leading thinkers on religion in public life. I asked Sean to take on sort of three missions in this effort, to advise me on how religion impacts U.S. foreign policy priorities, to support the entire State Department in better understanding religion and, and engaging religious communities, and to establish wider and deeper ties with key stakeholders across the globe. In fulfilling those mandates, Sean has pulled together a team of experts who have met with thousands of religious officials from five continents. And by the way, uh, Sean not only is here tonight, but he's here with his chief of staff, Leora Danan, who is a Rice grad, folks. So there you go. How about where she is? Stand up. Are you here somewhere? Where are you? Oh. Bashful. She's over here. Okay. Embarrass her. Um, Sean's office also includes a special envoy on anti-Semitism, Ira Froman, Foreman, and a special representative to Muslim communities, Shariq Zafar. And he grew up, by the way, right here in Houston. And he has built, they have built, frankly, together valuable connections to Muslim men and women in every corner of the globe. Now, we've also greatly expanded our Office of International Religious Freedom headed by Ambassador David Saperstein, a brilliant person, who champions the principle of religious liberty everywhere, including places where people are in danger each day simply because of what they believe or who they are. In addition, we reach out to multilateral institutions, our acting envoy to the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, Arsalan Suleiman, is engaged in comprehensive dialogue with members of that body on issues that include political crises, economic development, refugee relief, human rights, and religious pluralism. And finally, we are striving to enhance our training with the goal of having people in every single one of our more than 240 embassies and consulates who can engage knowledgeably with religious actors in the country where they are posted. But we don't, and this is important, we don't establish contacts just for the sake of having interesting conversations. We do so to make progress towards our foreign policy and our national security goals. And I believe this effort is one of those multiple efforts necessary in today's world to help make America safer in a responsible and thoughtful, and perhaps even hopefully visionary way. For example, last year we hosted a workshop for religious leaders in Nigeria. The topic was both a moral and a practical one, corruption. The religious leaders were deeply concerned about the impact of corruption on their country and their communities. And let me tell you, I'm going to London in about uh, 10 days to meet with David Cameron as part of a conference that is going to be focused exclusively on corruption because it's stealing the future from people all over the world. 
And this group came together and recognized that addressing this kind of widespread challenge is obviously not easy. As one observant said, when we fight corruption, corruption fights back. So they came up with a plan of action to push for reform at all levels, to teach citizens how to become whistleblowers, and to convey a message from their own pulpits that corruption is not some inevitable part of human existence, but rather an abuse that can and must be stopped. Just as we understood and started when we formed the FBI and put together federal prosecutions and created accountability in our own country and still work to achieve it. About 16 months ago, President Obama announced plans, as you all know, to normalize relations with Cuba. The Vatican, and specifically Pope Francis and Cardinal Ortega, encouraged this diplomatic breakthrough, which has vastly improved the standing of the United States in our hemisphere and been welcomed enthusiastically by the Cuban people. The Cold War has been slow to thaw in Cuba. And for almost three decades, the government did not even recognize Christmas. But years of official hostility did not destroy the church. And as we know, the, the eradication of organized religion was a basic pillar of communism, not just in Cuba, but also in Russia, Eastern Europe, China, and Vietnam. Well, the moment has long since arrived to pronounce that effort dead. Today, the United States is speaking up for religious liberty in each and every one of the countries I just listed, and many more. There was a time when engaging on religion with people overseas meant having meetings almost exclusively with men, and usually very old men. Today, we are in touch with a much more diverse group of figures, female religious scholars shaping the interpretation of sacred texts in Indonesia, women in the Gambia working within their religious communities to end the practice of female genital mutilation or cutting, religious activists in many countries who speak up on behalf of interreligious cooperation and the rights of minorities. The importance of our outreach efforts was demonstrated even more dramatically in 2014 when the terrorist group Daesh, ISIL as people call it, began seizing territory in Syria and Iraq, overrunning major cities, murdering civilians, raping and enslaving women and girls, selling them on the chopping block to their fighters or giving them as a gift for the fight. And we learned of these outrages firsthand because of the contacts of our religious freedom office. The contacts that they had developed with religious minorities here and in the Middle East, especially the Yazidi population in northern Iraq. And when the assault by Daesh began, Yazidis in the region started appealing for help from the world. Some using mobile phones that they were literally charging in their cars while heading up the rugged roads of Mount Sinjar in search of safety. And as the deadly crisis unfolded in ways that you all witnessed in horror, we stayed in real-time communication with the Yazidis and their intermediaries. And these links were absolutely critical in helping us to be able to mobilize our aircraft, our helicopters, people, fighters on the ground, in order to pinpoint where the civilians were hiding and where the terrorists were gathering and be able to rescue people from certain death. This, in turn, allowed our military to make nightly drops of food and water to the trapped civilians and to launch airstrikes against Daesh that allowed thousands to escape. And it all happened, folks, because we had reached out and were working with different communities. In the time since, Daesh has continued to target religious minorities. They continue to kill Yazidis because they are Yazidis. Christians, because they are Christians. Shia, because they are Shia. In my judgment, and I registered this last month, Daesh is responsible for committing genocide against these groups in areas under its control. And we have worked hard 
to maintain our support for targeted communities because we believe that the protection of religious and ethnic minorities is a fundamental test, not just of our leadership, but of civilization itself. And make no mistake, this is not a war of civilizations against each other. This is a war of uncivilized, of barbarians against civilization. And we think that people ought to be free to choose, to change, to practice, to speak, and teach their religion anywhere without fear or intimidation. And this freedom of religious and ethnic identity is not contingent on numbers. Religious minorities should have the same rights as majorities. That's our belief. That's who we are in the United States. And that is the norm that we seek to uphold in country after country. So it's deeply disturbing today that Christians face persecution or repression in many countries, especially in the Middle East and parts of South Asia and Africa. In China, Tibetan Buddhists continue to suffer from official harassment and interference in the practice of their religion. Muslim minorities, including the Rohingya population in Burma, have also been singled out for discrimination. Meanwhile, in Europe and elsewhere, anti-Semitism is again on the rise, as evidenced by a significant increase in hate crimes, many of them violent, and also frequent incidents of intimidation and examples of anti-Semitic graffiti and verbal abuse. Ira Foreman, America's special envoy, who I mentioned earlier, has quietly reached out to a number of embattled Jewish communities. In one city in Northern Europe, he met with the sole remaining rabbi. Everybody else been chased out. A man so frequently harassed by local immigrant youths that he feared to make the short trip home from, 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 from his home to the synagogue. In other urban centers, Ira has worked with our embassies to alert local authorities to the need of upgrading security at Jewish facilities. And 20 years ago this spring, Holocaust Museum Houston opened its doors with the goal of promoting awareness of the dangers of prejudice. That message matters because as Rabbi Abraham Heschel warned, speech has power and words do not fade. What starts as a sound ends as a deed. It shouldn't be necessary, but Silence has been misinterpreted too many times in the past to risk it again. Make no mistake, the United States remains unalterably opposed to bigotry in all forms, including anti-Semitism. And our commitment on this point, I am telling you, will never weaken, never waver, and never change. Now, of course, one of the many problems with prejudice is that once it begins, it can be very hard to contain. The last century saw a lot of blood shed in the wake of demagogues exploiting nationalism and fear. Today, anti-Muslim feelings are also on the rise in Europe, where extreme nationalist parties have been making inroads. In France and Belgium, Special Representative Zafar has led efforts to ensure immigrant communities in those countries are aware and empowered with respect to their civil rights. But there's a lot that we need to do, and there's a lot that we are determined to do. There are troubling indications here in the United States where some have urged a ban on Muslim visitors and where false stories about large numbers of Muslim Americans supposedly celebrating the 9-11 attacks have been willfully disseminated by people who don't bother to check their facts. Let me tell you how it is. Muslims have lived in the United States since the founding of our country. They have fought on our side in every single one of our wars. They make their homes in every region, including proudly and productively right here in Houston. They pursue a broad range of occupations. In other words, they are Americans. And many, and 
Many are from families that have been here for centuries. Others, yes, arrived more recently. But they are part of the social fabric that defines and binds our country together. Efforts to smear them collectively for the actions of a few are despicable and no more logical than it would have been in the 1990s to hold all Christians accountable for the atrocities committed against Muslim populations in Bosnia and Kosovo. Now, sometimes I'm asked by people here at home, why don't Muslim leaders speak out more boldly against terrorism? My reply is, they do. They are. And too many people haven't been listening. Political leaders from across the Muslim world have condemned Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and many other terrorist groups. And they are part of our 66-nation coalition now in the fight against these terrorists. In addition, individual Muslim leaders, Sunni and Shia, on every continent have stated clearly that terrorist acts of the type perpetrated by these groups are contrary to the letter and the spirit of Islam. The problem is that verbal condemnations aren't enough. They don't complete the job. And that's why President Obama is leading this coalition with the active participation of many Arab and Muslim states in order to defeat Daesh at its core in Syria and Iraq, and in order to strengthen the capacity of partners to counter violent extremists wherever they arise. Now, this effort is being prosecuted on many fronts, my friends, and it is designed to deprive the terrorists of the safe havens that they seek, degrade their leadership at the same time, hammer their sources of revenue, and discredit their ideas. And we are doing that in so many different ways with a new center that opened in, in, in the UAE and Abu Dhabi, where Arabic speakers are using all the social media and we're countering on a daily basis, a new one opening in Saudi Arabia and Malaysia. This is happening. We're making progress. Daesh has been driven from about a third of the populated territory at once controlled in Iraq and Syria. And even as it seeks to extend its networks into other countries, more and more of Daesh's fighters are deserting refusing to fight, and surveys show that its appeal is declining. President Obama and I have said from the beginning that the fight against Daesh and similar groups takes years, not months. It's not defined by some decisive battle in which all of a sudden you say it's gone. Even Al-Qaeda, though it's not the threat it was to us, still roams in individual bands in different places. And that's because the real challenge is not simply to defeat one group in one place at one time, but to create a global environment in which efforts to summon terrorist recruits fall on deaf ears. Now, this is far from a simple task, believe me, because we have learned that terrorists can emerge from anywhere, including the United States of America and Western Europe. Believe it or not, there are some Americans fighting in Syria. There are Germans fighting. There are French fighting there. And they've had three and a half, four years to kind of send a few people back to different places, and we've seen the results of that. And what we've also learned is you don't have to be poor or repressed or receive special training to go be one of those recruits. You don't even have to be religious. A couple of years ago, when some British teenagers headed to Syria to join Daesh, guess what? They brought with them two books, the Koran for dummies and Islam for dummies. Daesh recruiting videos actually include a religious narrative, but they also point to an idyllic picture of Daesh families having picnics and going to amusement parks. The reality is that we still don't have a fully satisfactory answer as to why some people, married, educated, older, fall under the lethal spell of terrorism. But I got news for you. We got some pretty good clues. For example, multiple studies show a correlation between political repression and the rise of violent extremist organizations. People are far more likely to become radicalized when they have directly experienced corruption 
or violence at the hands of the state. Witness that fruit vendor in Tunisia who was slapped around trying to sell his goods and slapped by a police officer and in protest went and burnt himself in front of the police station and that is what ignited the Arab Spring. Not religion. Denial of fundamental freedoms, including religious freedom, deprives people of voice and dignity and it tends to force legitimate religious and political activities underground and it fills many with an anger that makes them far more susceptible to terrorist recruiters. Even worse, there is an active effort by terrorist groups now to recruit children, 10 years old, 12, 14, and indoctrinate them into radical ideologies while they are still too young to know any better. This is actually something that I have had described to me by a fellow foreign minister in a country in Africa and in the Middle East. The terrorists are actively pursuing a long-term plan, a multi-generational plan. And this foreign minister said to me, you know, these guys have a 30-year plan. We don't even have a five-year plan. And the lure of extremism can be hard to resist, my friends, if you are a child with nothing in your stomach and somebody offers you regular meals, companionship, and an upside-down worldview in which you have a place on center stage. What does that tell us? It means that we have to have a multi-generational plan of our own to stop terrorists and see that hope wins out over despair. Today, the vast majority of young people live in developing countries. The median age in Germany is 46. In the United States, it is 37. In the Middle East and North Africa, it's about 21. Country after country, 65% under the age of 30, 60% under the age of 25, 50% under the age of 21. Now, I got news for you. Hundreds of millions of them need to go to school tomorrow, and they're not going to go to school tomorrow. That means just to keep pace, we will have to create hundreds of millions of new jobs each year at a time when new technologies are making many old jobs obsolete. Now, this is obviously a daunting challenge, but failure is not an option. Religious leaders of all backgrounds are constantly reminding us that we have an obligation to reach out to the poor and the marginalized. And you can find that in almost every religion. We also have a deeply rooted interest in doing so because nothing could be more dangerous for our future than the prospect of huge numbers of young adults wandering the globe, frustrated in their ambitions, and acutely aware because they all got smartphones, most of them. They get to see what others have, and they get to think about what they don't have. So here's what we have to do, among other things, and there's going to be more that I'll talk about in these next months. But governments need to improve the climate for entrepreneurial activity and investment in many of these countries. Business people should take advantage of every opportunity while giving back to the communities in which they operate. Women have to be allowed to contribute in these countries, their energy, their intellect, and their skills in order to help economies flourish. I don't know a country in the world, I don't know a team in sports that can get by or win with half the team on the bench. And that is true for us with women in the world. We have to make sure we're empowering people. Civil society has to do its part by mobilizing populations in order to insist on governance that is effective and honest. I can't tell you as secretary how it has struck me, the absence of good governance in many places. There are more failed and failing states uh, than one would like. And religious leaders particularly can remind us that public budgets are not just about numbers, they are also moral documents. What we choose to invest in reflects what we consider the best measure of real success to be. A rising uh, GDP is obviously desirable, we all want that. But other benchmarks are far more relevant to whether young people feel a greater stake in building their countries up 
rather than tearing them down. Most religions understand that truth. So did Senator Robert Kennedy when he said, in the 1960s, our gross national product, which is what we called it then, does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. The good news that I see is that for all the challenges that uh, our differences present today, all of the major religions share a sense of universal values. They seek to define the things that make life worthwhile, a moral truth based on the dignity of all human beings. That's one reason that religious organizations have been so supportive of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that we approved at the UN last fall. Read it. It's a groundbreaking document that embraces a vision for this future. This is a global to-do list designed to make gains on a wider range of global problems. It's also a statement of faith that real progress is possible if we continue working together to eliminate extreme poverty, to improve maternal and child health care, to, to guarantee access to education for every boy and girl, to enhance our capacity to fight back against epidemic disease, malaria, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, and now the Zika virus. Each day, religious and other non-governmental organizations bring enormous resources, credibility, and commitment to assist in every one of those life-saving enriching efforts that I just described. Another important component of sustainable development goals in another area where religious groups have been raising exactly the right issues is climate change. As Secretary of State and before that as a Senator, I have been involved in the climate debate for more than a quarter of a century. And I had a chance to reminisce with 41 that it was almost 25 years ago, whatever long, uh, that, that, that President George H.W. Bush and Secretary Jim Baker took part in the first formal attempt to respond to the threat of climate change, the 1992 UN Framework Agreement on Climate Change that was reached in Rio de Janeiro. Back then, the danger that was caused by greenhouse gas emissions was considered by many to be simply an environmental issue. But it's always been much more than that. It's a health issue. Largest single cause of children in the United States of America being hospitalized during the summer is environmentally induced asthma. We spend billions on it. It's a health issue. It's a prosperity issue because there are jobs to be gained in this. It's not a choice between protecting it or not protecting it. There are jobs to be created, and it's a moral issue. Religious communities, including America's indigenous populations, have long been aware of this intimate connection between environmental stewardship and harmony with God. And by the way, Teddy Roosevelt, Doug Brinkley knows so well, our first great environmental president, carved out our parks and our awareness of this in the beginning of the last century. More recently, the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church Patriarch Bartholomew asked, when will we learn that to commit a crime against the natural world is a sin? In last year's Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change, Muslim leaders called for clear targets to phase out greenhouse gas emissions and invest in a clean energy economy. And in his encyclical a year ago, Pope Francis cited the physical damage being done by climate change to our forests, our oceans, our polar regions, and the economic harm to those who depend for a living on agriculture and marine resources. Religious leaders urge us every day to pursue the common good. In this case, good means a revolution in energy production and consumption that can preserve our environment and create millions of new jobs. And this is, to say the least, a timely message. In the Houston area, besides being a major energy producer, obviously, 
uh, and there is going to be pumping of oil and gas for 30, 40 years to come. Nobody's talking about some sudden disparity, but there's a transitional process. And the emissions, no matter what you're pumping, have to be controlled. But in the Houston area, you've had four major floods in the last 12 months. And your vulnerability to sea level rise is alarming. And the most recent study of scientists came out and warned us about what's happening in Antarctica. The studies I've seen show Galveston, Padre, and Matagorda islands potentially inundated before the end of the century and significant parts of this city at risk. Now, maybe those predictions will prove to be wrong. And if so, and we act now to create a new energy economy, what's the worst case? We'll be stuck with cleaner air, a healthier environment, sources of power that are sustainable for many generations to come, better health, less cancer induced by pollutant particulates, and so forth. You run the list. But if the dire predictions are on target and we don't act, we invite catastrophe. So the United States has to be a leader in meeting this generational challenge. But we can't do it alone. And by the way, we won't have to. Last December, nearly 200 countries assembled in Paris and pledged to move in the direction of a low carbon future. What they really did was send a message to the marketplace about the future. Not a mandate, no automatic immediate transition, plenty of time for companies to move and adjust in new R&D and technology to have battery storage breakthrough or other uh, solar, different kinds of energy use, or clean coal, or clean whatever it's going to be. Some Thomas Edison of the future is going to appear. The next, you know, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs is going to come out of a basin with a new idea, and boom. Last Friday in New York with my granddaughter in my lap, I had the honor of representing the United States in making our pledge to live up to our responsibility official. And one of the ironies of this whole debate is that for years we've heard people argue that there's no point in acting because climate change isn't happening. Now some of those same people are saying it's too late to stop climate change. And so there's still no point in acting. Well, they were wrong before and they're wrong now. As Pope Francis advised us, it is never too late. God's world has incredible healing power. And human choices can change the tide in global warming. It is up to us to shape our future. It is up to us to choose our destiny. And that is the message that I would leave with you this evening. It's up to us. And that begins with those of us who are in government. It's up to us to recognize that we can't lead a world that we don't understand. And that we can't understand the world if we fail to comprehend and honor the central role that religion plays in the lives of billions of people. And that is why in the State Department today, our experts are engaging with religious actors more broadly and more knowledgeably than ever before, seeking their help, their counsel, their support, as we strive to improve governance, curb corruption, stop genocide, safeguard human rights, reduce poverty, and save our planet from the most harmful consequences of climate change. And this unprecedented commitment of time and resources is paying off. It is helping to make our diplomacy more effective because it corresponds not to some arcane foreign policy theory, but to the world as it is. And in so doing, we are drawing on values that are at the heart of virtually every enduring religious and ethical tradition. Now, this is not to say that every religion is basically the same because it all means the same thing, because that's not the case. Religions differ widely in their origins, their texts, their rites, their beliefs. But amid that diversity, there are common and often eloquent commitments to help the disadvantaged, to pursue peace, to follow the golden rule, and respect the fundamental dignity of every single human being. Over the decades, many of those concerns found an echo in such documents as the UN Charter, the UN Declaration on Human Rights. So today, when we act to uphold international standards of justice and law, we are at the same time heeding Abraham Lincoln's admonition to do right as God gives us to see the right. And John Kennedy's observation in his inaugural 
Here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. 54 years ago, President Kennedy came here to Rice to announce our nation's goal that within the decade, we were going to land a man on the moon. He said that America would make that choice not because it was easy, but because it would serve to organize and test the upper limit of our energy and our skill, and that inspired a whole nation. Today and every day, we face that test right here on Earth to work towards a future that truly reflects the better angels of our nature. To succeed, we have to have the wisdom to embrace our duty to the planet, the courage to fight back against prejudice and bigotry wherever it appears or they appear, and the boldness to reach across boundaries and seize the opportunities before us to translate shared values, religious and otherwise, into accomplishments that will make our world more humane, more secure, and more just than it has ever been. My friends here in uh, Houston, uh, 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 Rice, uh, it's very simple. It really is up to us. Thank you all.